Well, good morning, everyone. It is wonderful to see the church so filled uh, for our harvest celebration. If you're visiting with us, it's great to have you with us as we meet as God's people to give Him thanks this day and to hear from His Word. If you're across in the hall and the TV is a bit quiet, there is a TV remote somewhere up at the front. Um, someone will hopefully turn you up or turn me up if you can't hear me. Uh, but it's great to be here to be able to worship. God together. As we gather, just a few quick announcements just to keep everybody up to date uh, with various things. Um, firstly, just to keep you up to date in terms of regulations. So currently we're at one meter. Uh, we don't know whether that will change in coming weeks or not, but at the moment we're at one meter. Regarding face coverings, we ask that when you're moving about, you wear them. That's currently the regulation is in and out and moving about. You have to wear them. And then we'd encourage you and recommend strongly that you wear them for singing. The chief medical officer, the chief scientific officer have encouraged us um, to ask the congregation to do this. This is to help um, uh, cut down on the amount of aerosol in the room. We do try to keep the doors open to get enough ventilation and we hope no one um, gets too cold um, in that process. Regarding toilet facilities, they're across in the hall. All toilets are, again, open. And we just ask you to clean down the hard surfaces with the dead hole wipes that are uh, available. And again, to use the hand sanitizer that's located throughout. Other announcements just to keep you up to date. Uh, firstly, could I ask the committee to wait behind at the front here after the service? This is to help sort out getting the gifts ready for distribution. As you can see, we have a lot of fruit and some veg to give out, and it'd be great if the committee can help us to do that and distribute that among our members. Uh, so that's immediately after the service. Could I also ask the session to wait behind for a brief moment uh, as well, just to sort out one little thing. Then... Next Sunday, oh no, this coming coming week, first and foremost, uh, our GB is back up and running again. Those are the dates that we're running this um, October. Just to remind you that the company section are taking it once every three weeks. So this incoming week, it will be the juniors that will be meeting after the explorers, uh, but none of the other parts of the company will be meeting. I think there's homework that's been sent out um, for the rest to be doing. So that's the GB. We will have information about the BB very soon. We're just trying to get the final details sorted out for that. Then on Wednesday evening, we have our, our midweek service here in the church at 8 p.m. We're continuing our study through 1 John at that meeting and our time of prayer as well. And then Sunday morning next week, as we have every week, we have our prayer time at 10.50 or 10.45 a.m. across in the church halls. This is a chance to come together to prepare our hearts for worship as we come before the Lord each Sunday. And then next Sunday, Drum Lee will be having their harvest service. Please note something about Drum Lee's harvest service. It's not in the morning. They're not actually meeting in the morning. They've decided, uh, way back in August, we decided that we didn't know what restrictions would be, so they have decided to go for the evening harvest instead, and that's going to be at 7 p.m. next Sunday evening, and there will be a supper afterwards uh, as well under the, the, the current regulations. Uh, so that's next Sunday um, evening at 7 p.m. for Drum Lee's harvest. Those are all the announcements, and we're not here for announcements. We're here to worship God, and again, it's wonderful to see so many faces that I haven't seen in what feels like a lifetime, but it's great to be able to worship God, and as we do that and we start our time together, we're going to do something slightly different. There's going to be a little video played. It's the words of Psalm 100 as we prepare our hearts to worship, and immediately following that, we will rise to sing our first item of praise, which is, Come, ye thankful people, come.
And as we come as God's people, let us come before him now in prayer. Let us pray. O great God of highest heaven, we enter into your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise. Our hearts are full of the sights and sounds of this harvest season, and they are a great reminder to us of your goodness and faithfulness to us for another year. Your word tells us that every good and perfect gift comes from you. And as we look around the church today, we see the fruits of the physical harvest and we rejoice. You are the great provider. And out of your abundant goodness, you have blessed us again and again. Our hearts are full of thanksgiving and rejoicing. For you are the Lord of the harvest. We praise you for your greatest provision of all in Christ Jesus that through his coming to this earth, his dwelling among us, his giving of his own life and raising from the dead, our sins have been forgiven. And we can now become your children as we trust in him. Yet, Lord, we confess that so often we walk blindly through this world, ignoring your goodness and faithfulness to us, blinded by our lusts and fears, constantly complaining rather than rejoicing, We do not give thanks and praise because we are turned in on ourselves. We do not submit to your kingly authority because we love our own agenda and will. We don't tremble before your word and we disregard your commands because we seek our own righteousness and kingdom instead of yours. Father, forgive us for loving ourselves more than you and loving ourselves more than our neighbor for failing desperate or falling desperately short of your glory and for breaking your good command. Heal our remaining corruption by your Spirit. Set us free to serve and witness for Christ by the power of your Spirit. As we gather today, may we know him working among us. May he make his presence known here. May he aid us as we sing praise to your name, as we come before you in prayer and we hear from your word. For we need his power this day and every day as we seek to glorify and enjoy you forever. But we pray this in the name of our dear Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, boys and girls, you're sort of dotted throughout the church and also across the way. What I'm going to ask you to do this morning is something we haven't done for a very long time. I'm going to get you to come up to the front. Now, when you come up to the front, you'll see dots on the floor. Our carpet is not sick. These are for you to sit on in your family bubble. So what I encourage you to do is to come up and grab a a, a spot for your family to sit on. So that's either yourself or with your brothers and sisters. And I will meet you down the front just now. And if you're crossing the hall, come on ahead across. Uh, We'll try and and, um, steward that as much as possible um, for safety reasons. So we give the boys and girls a moment. I'm going to head down to the front to join them. Don't be afraid. (laughs) I just fear nobody wants to join me this morning. So grab a dot for your family. And you all sort of sit on that. Well, don't all sit on top of each other, but sit close to each other on that dot. Ah. And you forgot something. I forgot my clicker. And Vivian will start to panic now when I ask her to move it forward. Guys, there's spaces on the other side there if you want to hop across. Emily, there's one on the far side there if you want to. Naboth. Well, boys and girls, this is a little bit different than we're used to, but we wanted to try and start to do a few things to get you guys back up the front and a bit more involved. It also means you get to stretch your legs away from mum and dad for part of the service. But this morning, 
I want to ask you a question. Why do we celebrate harvest, do you think? You don't know? Well, we're going to hopefully find out. But anyone else want to have a guess as to why we might celebrate harvest? Yes. Make pumpkin pie. That is part of it, and that is a lovely part to have, most definitely. Um, I used to live with a guy who made it every November for Thanksgiving, and we were all forced to eat it. (laughs) He was a good cook. I promise he was a good cook. But I'm going to explain to you today why we celebrate harvest at all, or what the whole service is about. It's to do with these two things on the screen. So what have we got on the screen? What do we think? A party, yeah. What's the other thing? Yeah. Camping, yeah, a tent. Um, Now, you may go, what on earth has this got to do? We're not talking about going to a festival. What we're talking about is something slightly different. In the Bible, we hear about the first harvest, and we find it in a book that we don't often turn to. It's the book of Leviticus, which is all these laws from God's Word. But towards the end of it, we're told about harvest. And God tells the people, on the 15th day of the seventh month, When you have gathered all the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day you shall shall be solemn rest, and on the eighth day shall be solemn rest. And you shall take the first fruits of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and broad, broad of leafy trees, and willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before the Lord for seven days." You shall celebrate it with a feast and on this, uh, for the seven days in that year. It is a statute forever that throughout the generations you shall celebrate it in the seventh month. And then he goes on to talk about what the tent's about. He says, You shall dwell in tents for seven days. All native Is- Israelites shall dwell in tents. Then your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in tents when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Now, what's God telling us? This is all about harvest, okay? And part of that is that we give thanks and we remember for what God gives us, what he provides for us. So when you look around the church today, you're going to see fruit and veg everywhere. You're going to see lots of lovely flowers that people have decorated for us. That's the fruits of the world. That's what God has given us, these beautiful things to eat and to see and to smell. Uh, And we give thanks for that. That's what we do at harvest time. When all the harvest is gathered in, when all the farmers have done the big work for the year and as they get ready for winter, they give thanks for what God has done. But the tent is the interesting bit. It's a reminder. They were to live in tents, and we don't have to live in tents now, but it's a reminder of what God had done for them in Egypt. He rescued them from Pharaoh. He brought them out over the Red Sea, and he made. uh, they lived in the wilderness for 40 years, intense. And the reality is they remembered that God had rescued them. That's why they would go back to the tents. So one of the ways we do that is not here this morning for harvest, but sometimes we get together and we have a supper together. You know the way we have the bread and the wine? Well, those are us remembering God rescuing us. And really that's what we come to do today. We come to give thanks for the fact that God not only provides, but he rescues and we give him thanks. So we're going to thank him now. We're going to pray to him. All right, so we're going to close our eyes and bow our heads, and we're going to talk to God just for a minute, and then we're going to sing a song giving thanks to Him. So let's pray. Father, we thank You as we come on this harvest day. We thank You for the harvest for this year and all the beauty that we see around us in Your creation. We pray as we think about that, that we would give You thanks for it, but also that we would remember what You have done for us in Jesus and give You even more thanks because you are great and you want what is best for us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So boys and girls, there is a worksheet for today. You can pick up a worksheet. Um, There will be a pen somewhere in your pew if you need a pen. Um, But you can pick one of those up after we sing. But we're going to stand to sing now. And we're going to sing a piece that you all hopefully know really well, If I Were a Butterfly. And if you know the actions to it, I'd encourage you to do them as well. Alistair's going to try and do it while he's playing the guitar, okay? Um, (laughs) So let us stand to worship God as we sing, If I Were a Butterfly. And then, boys and girls, you can head back to your seats with a worksheet afterwards.
Boys and girls, if you want to pick up a, a worksheet there, you can. And then if you want to head on back to your chairs, that would be great. And thank you for joining me this morning. One of the wonderful things of being at General Assembly this week was an opportunity to chat with other colleagues. And a few colleagues have been doing this with the dots on the floor. Um, so I thought we may borrow it and see how it would go. And it's great to have the kids back at the front uh, with us. It's slightly different than, than we're used to, um, but it's nice to have a little bit more of normality. At this point in our service, we come now to reflect on God's Word, to hear from it, and then to consider it. As we do that, we pause for a moment in prayer. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have given us your Word, a Word that is able not only to tell us of the joys of harvest and where everything comes from, but a word that is able to make us wise unto salvation. As we come now to consider it, we pray that your Spirit would open it afresh for us. He would help us in our understanding, but also that he would help us and aid us to live it out. But we ask it now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. If you have a, a Bible there in front of you, I'd love you to turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. A while ago, we considered this letter in quite some detail. Um, today, we're going to look just at one part of it. It's page 1,179, 1,179 of the Pew Bibles. We're getting right into the heart of Paul's letter here, but uh, I want to reflect on it in light of harvest. So let's pick up in verse 1, and we're going to read through until verse 16 of Philippians chapter 2. Paul writes, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance of a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence but much more in my absence, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation, in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. Amen, and may God bless to us the reading from his word today. I wonder this morning, uh, as we gather for Harvest Thanksgiving, what are you thankful for? Maybe a question we don't ask often enough. Every year in America at Thanksgiving, they take time to create lists of things that they're thankful for. But I wonder what are we thankful for this morning? The old story of Robinson Crusoe, talks about a man who was shipwrecked on a lonely island. But while he was on that island, he drew up a list and with two columns. One he called the evil, the other he called the good. And he started to look at where he was and what had happened. He was cast on a desolate island, but he was alive, not drowned as his ship's company had been. He was apart from human society, but he wasn't starving. He had no clothes, but he was in a hot enough climate where he didn't need them. He was without means of defense, but he had found no animal or wild beast yet that could do him any harm. He had no one to whom he could speak, 
But God had been gracious enough to send the ship so near to the shore that he could get out of it all the things necessary for his basic wants. So he concluded that there is not any condition in the world so miserable, but that one could find something for which to be grateful. I wonder if we were in the same situation, would we be as grateful? Today, as I said, we come to celebrate the harvest, to give thanks to God for another year. But as we do that, I come back to that first question. What are you grateful for? There are many things that we can be grateful for. Just think about this morning and your routine from this morning. You got out of a nice, warm, comfy bed. You got into a house that was warm and dry. There was fresh water to have a drink to wash your teeth. There was hot water to maybe have a shower or a bath. There was electricity that if you got up early enough this morning, it was still dark, and you were able to move about the house freely and know where you're going. You opened the cupboards and there was food. You opened the wardrobes, there was clothes. Transport, you were able to get here fairly easily. And maybe one that we don't often think of, but one that we should be very much thankful for is the fact that we can meet here as God's people freely. There's no fear of the police coming at the door or us being arrested or dragged out or even killed. We have the ability to meet in freedom. Now, we could go on and on and on, but I wonder, are we grateful? And who are we grateful to? See, there's a little story I've told before to the children. uh, It's called Eric Says Thank You. And little Eric, one morning, thanks his mum for the toast that that she has made for him. And what what his mother realizes is this is an opportunity to teach him that food comes from somewhere. It's not just something that magically appears. And so she tells him to go and thank the greengrocer who stocked the bread. And he goes there, and the greengrocer says, well, you need to go to the delivery man, and on and on and on the list goes until he gets to the farmer. And he thinks he's got to the end, and and the farmer says, well, no, there's still one more person to thank. And he says, without God, there would have been no rain or sunshine or fertile soil to make the crops grow. And so little Eric is, is thankful at last to the one who has given it all, God. And every good and perfect gift, as James tells us, comes from above. And today, as we gather to give thanks for his provision for another year of harvest, we see that. I was chatting to to one of the elders just before we came in here, and he was saying, while the year started out badly, it's picked up fairly well, and, and it's been a good harvest. We even explored it with the children, this reminder of coming together to give thanks. And it's an important thing to do. God sets it down as a statute to last all generations. But as I've sat down this week and and thought about harvest and the physical provisions that God provides, I couldn't help but thinking about the greatest provision that God provides for us and what it cost Him for us to have it. So as we come this morning to give thanks for the physical provision, I want us to spend a little bit of time today as we look at this passage considering God's greatest provision and how we are to respond. I wonder if I was to ask you this morning what's your greatest need, what your answer might be. One of the things that all of us cannot do without is water. If we go more than three days without water, we're most definitely dehydrated. We may sadly pass on. But others might say, well, my greatest need at this moment in time is money or peace, maybe even information. We live in an age where everyone wants information. But is that what our greatest need is? Don Carson, one of the great theologians of our age, once wrote this. He says, if God had perceived that our greatest need was economics, he would have sent us an economist. If he had perceived that our greatest need was entertainment, he would have sent us a comedian or an artist. If he had perceived that our greatest need was political instability, he would have sent us a politician. If he perceived that our greatest need was health, he would have sent us a doctor. But he perceived that our greatest need is in fact our sin, our alienation from God, our profound rebellion, our death. And so he sent us a 
a Savior. The reality is our greatest need is a Savior. That's what we see in this passage, that God sent His Son. He didn't just send us any old Savior. He sent us the one who He knew could save us in Jesus Christ. And look how much it cost. And look at this passage again with me. If you have a Bible there, I'd love you to open up to Philippians 2. Look at what we're told about Jesus in this, what is known as a Christological hymn. We're told that He had all the riches of heaven, everything he deserved, everything that was his by right, and he gave it all up. He gave up equality with God, and he came and became nothing. He made himself nothing. He came into this world and gave of himself. And not only that, we're told that he became a servant. Actually, the original language says there he became a slave. If you know anything about slaves from history, they have no rights no escape. They have to be obedient to their master. Jesus became a slave to humanity, and he died on the cross. Now, not only in the Roman culture was that that an utter humiliation to die on a cross, it was also the fact that in God's Word it says to die on a tree is a curse. So, not only was he humiliated before man on the cross, he was cursed because he died on the tree. This is what our Savior was willing to give for us. I recently heard an interesting illustration to give us a glimpse of what Christ was doing for us. It was about a grandfather and his grandson. And one day, the grandfather walked into the room, and the grandson was bouncing about in his playpen, crying at the top of his voice. When Johnny saw his grandfather, he reached out his little chubby fingers and hands, and he said, out, gramps, out. It was only natural that the grandfather wanted to reach down and lift him out of his predicament. But as soon as he went to do that, the child's mother came in. And she said, no, Johnny, you're in there because you're being punished. So you must stay in it. Now, the grandfather was at a loss in what to do. The tears of the child and his chubby little hands reaching out reached deep into the grandfather's heart. But he wasn't going to to go against the mother's firmness that the child had to be punished. But love found a way. The grandfather knew that he couldn't take the child out of the playpen. So what did he do? He climbed in to the pen with him. And he sat with him through his punishment. Dear friends, that is what our Lord Jesus Christ did for us. In leaving the riches and the glory of heaven, And coming to earth, he climbed in with us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. But not only did he climb in with us and take or sit there through all that went on, he took the punishment we deserved. The story could have gone on that the the grandfather forfeited his freedom for the child, but that would be a stretch too far, but not for God. Christ took on the punishment for our sin. He gave his life in our place. He met our greatest need, that of forgiveness of our sins. As 1 Timothy 1 and 15 states, Christ came into this world to save sinners. This is a trustworthy saying. That's God's greatest plan of provision. That is God's greatest provision for us. But I wonder, what are you going to do with it? Because we have to do something with this great provision. The same as we do with all the other physical provisions, we are called to do something with this provision of God. Well, Paul comments on it in verses 9 through to 16. Let's have a look at them together. The first thing that we're called to do with this great provision is to trust in it. In our world today, trust is in short supply. Not many people trust the government, After COVID, everything seems wrecked. After Brexit, even more so. And trust is an important aspect of all of our lives. We seek to find people who are trustworthy. Well, Scripture tells us that our God is trustworthy, that He is faithful. And we see that each and every year. In His Word, He promises that that while the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest Here we have again the harvest. God is faithful to his word. And because he is, what we see then and here is that he's faithful in what Christ has done. 
He always keeps his promises. And Scripture tells us that what Christ has done is enough for us to be right with God. Otherwise, what happens in verse 9 would never have happened. Therefore, God has exalted him to the highest place and given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. If what Christ had done was not enough, if it hadn't paid the price for our sin, if it hadn't reconciled us to God, God would not have exalted him to that position. His once and for all sacrifice was enough. We don't need to add anything extra to it. All we're told to do is trust in it and rely on Christ to come before him and seek forgiveness for our sins and rely on him to rely on God's greatest provision. Because the reality is if we don't, well, while we may enjoy a nice life here, we'll be lost for all eternity. So we first need to learn to trust. And God has given us ample reason to trust Him. But it's not just a case of saying, I believe or I trust in Jesus. There must be an action. We looked at this only last week in the book of James. We're called to live in light of God's provision, to live it out. Look at verse 12. Paul says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you. Here we have the wonderful reality of what happens after God has saved us, after He has justified us, made us right with Himself. He starts the work of, of sanctification, of working in us and transforming us, of changing us. But we then have to work it out. Think of the, the trust exercise we've done a few times here before, where someone says, look, you stand in front of me, you fall back, and I'll catch you. Well, the reality is it's all good and well, the person who's falling back saying, oh, I believe you, it'll happen, it's, it's grand, but never falls back. He doesn't believe, he doesn't trust but the one who falls back proves their faith, proves that they actually believe what God has said and relies on Him. The reality is we must do the same. We must rely on what God has done and then live in light of it. How do we live in light of it? Well, this working out our salvation with fear and trembling, Paul talks about it at the start of chapter 2. It's seeking to build one another up. It's, it's living the life that God has called us to, to love the Lord our God with all our mind, heart, and soul, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And we're to do all this, note in verse 14, without complaining or arguing or grumbling. In some parts of Mexico, a unique phenomenon happens where both cold and hot springs sit side by side. And because of this convenience of nature, the women there bring their laundry to this point, and they boil the clothes in one side, they rinse them out in the other. Now, a tourist observed this at one stage, and he asked his tour guide, or he said to his tour guide, I, I imagine that they think God is pretty generous to supply such ample, to have clean and hot water here side by side, free for use. And the guide replied, no, senor. There is much grumbling because he does not supply the soap. So often God provides us with far more than we will ever need. We grumble and complain. God has given us this wonderful provision. We should live in light of it. We should live as those who have been saved, those who have been redeemed, those who have been brought into God's family and forgiven of our sin that we do not face the punishment. So often we forget that God gives us more than we could imagine. And we ought to be thankful for it. Days like today allow us to be reminded of that, to be thankful for what God has done. But when you think about it, when you stop and pause, I wonder if you've ever realized that every second you have on this earth is given by God's good grace. Every second you have, every breath you take is given by Him out of His good graces. And He has given us time to come and trust in Christ. I recently heard a quote by C.H. Spurgeon, which I thought summarized what God has done for us in Christ so well. He says, Sovereign grace can make strangers into sons. 
We might go a bit further than that. Romans 5. When we were enemies of God, Christ died for us. God made us his sons even though we were his enemies. We are his children. And he wants what is best for us. And so we should learn to live in light of that. Seek to be part of his family. Seek to build one another up. Seek, in fact, to hold out to God's greatest provision. And that's lastly what Paul calls us to do here. To shine like stars in the universe as we hold out God's greatest provision. Today, the greatest need of our world is for God's sons and daughters to live a life that points to him. For the church to be the church. To do what it was always called to go and do. Paul gives us this illustration of shining like stars. What he has in mind is actually this. A harbor. The reality is Paul went through many different harbors, through many different storms. And what he saw every time was that the sailors would use the stars to guide them to the safe port. If the stars weren't there, they looked along the shoreline looking for the lights to bring them to the safe harbor. That's what Paul has in mind here as he calls us to shine like stars. That we in ourselves would point people to a Savior. That we would speak of our Savior. That we would direct them to the safe harbor in Christ. We're called to bless others with what we have been blessed with in Jesus. God's greatest provision. So often, many never hear the gospel anymore. We live in an age now where biblical literacy is at an all-time low in this country. If you don't realize that, maybe you do realize that. But that's where we're now at. If the church is not being the church, if the church is not sharing the gospel through loving our neighbor as ourselves, loving our God as we should, and witnessing to those around us, getting out instead of hiding behind four walls, we're not doing what God calls us to do. So today as we take time to give thanks, we come to give thanks for the physical harvest, yes. And we're so thankful that God continues to provide for us in this country. But let us pause for a moment to consider and to give thanks for God's greatest provision in Christ. But don't let it just be a thought. Come to trust in Him, in what God has done for us in Christ. But don't let it just be words. Let it be action too. Let us live in light of it and let us hold out God's greatest provision to others. For we are but one beggar leading other beggars to the feast. And what a wonderful gift to give anybody, but to point them to the Savior Christ. May God help us, and I pray that he does, to do this and more. As we rejoice and we give thanks for his goodness and his grace to each one of us today. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you, we give you thanks for what you have blessed us with physically today but also spiritually in Christ. Help us to see the beauty of your greatest provision. Help us to trust in it, but also help us to live it out, to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, to live as God as you have called us, and to hold that out to others. Father, you've called us to be light shining in the darkness. Help us to do just that, to know our Savior better, and so proclaim him in all that we do and say. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, as we come to respond to God's word just now, we're going to stand to sing again, and then afterwards we'll um, take our seats again for a time of prayer for others. But as we do that, I want to sing a piece that I was singing earlier on this week at General Assembly. My heart is filled with thankfulness. It reflects everything that God has done for us in Christ Jesus. But I want you to look at the very last verse, if we can pop it up at all, Vivian, that would be great. Um, oh, we've lost it all together. It talks about the same as in when I survey, to give our all for him, for what he has done for us. You look at there, whoever, whose perfect wisdom is our peace, whose every thought is love. And then the last part of it, for every day I have on earth is given by the king. That's what I was saying earlier on. Everything we have 
is given by God. Every second we have is given by God. So we're called in response to give our all, to love and to follow Him. Let us stand to praise God now as we reflect on His wonderful grace. Well, as we pause for a moment and come to our prayer for others, obviously this morning we want to give thanks for the harvest and for those who have provided it for us. But also I want us to think a little bit about the spiritual harvest and the work that goes on throughout the world. One of the things that we heard about this week and I had known about for a while that we are now doing, well, obviously we have missionaries throughout the world. We always have had missionaries throughout the world. But they're now doing little videos to explain a little bit of what they're actually doing, a little bit of what the United Appeal for Mission money that we collect goes towards. So I want to share a little video of actually two dear friends of mine. I haven't seen them since they left for here, um, but um, hopefully it's going to come up. This is one of the digital dispatches, and it's of Chris and Rachel Humphreys. They're out in Portugal. I'm going to tell you a little bit of the work that have been going on in the last year um, with them. So hopefully this is going to work for me. Hi, we're Chris and Rachel Humphreys, and we are PCI Global Mission Workers in the city of Porto in Portugal. We were commissioned in 2019 and came out to join the church planting team of Comunidade de Pedras Vivas. We work alongside James and Heather Cochran, who are also PCI Global Mission Workers. And together we're working to plant a church in a town called Senhora de Ora in the greater Porto area. Portugal as a whole is a nation that needs Jesus. Um, the number of evangelical Christians here is extremely low, it's around half a percent. And so there's a real need for Bible-focused, Christ-centered churches to be planted here. Of course, we know that this is a long-term work, but we really believe that God is building his church here in Porto. And we continue to pray that he will provide the increase and extend his kingdom here in Portugal. Like many other countries, Portugal is dealing with the coronavirus pandemic. From March until May of this year, Portugal was under lockdown. Shops, businesses and schools were closed and people were confined to their homes. As a result of this, many people lost their jobs and tourism fell. And for a country like Portugal that relies so much on tourists, this had a devastating impact on the economy. And several months on from this now, the economy is still recovering. This also brought many opportunities for us as a church because as people were confined to their homes, life slowed down and they gave time to think about important questions around life 
and death, questions such as, why is all this happening now? What would I do if I got sick? Or what would I do if the worst were happened to me or to a family member? And this brought us great opportunities for us as a church to help people think through these questions from a biblical perspective. We realised that we couldn't do any of this without the support from you all back in Ireland. United Appeal is so vital in supporting God's work right across the world. And we are so grateful to each of you who supports the United Appeal that enables us to be God's people on God's mission here in Porto. We recognise that none of this would be possible without prayer. We serve a God who delights to hear us pray. And so here are three things that we would love you to be praying for us right now as you seek to go deep and wide in God's mission. Firstly, pray for those in Portugal that have been affected by the coronavirus, for God to meet and to provide for these people's every need. And secondly, pray for us as a church that we would be good witnesses to those around about us in our community during this time. And lastly, pray for us as a family as we continue in language study and adaptation during our time here in Porto. Equally, please be assured of our prayers for you as a congregation of PCI as you minister to where God has placed you, being his witnesses to a needy world in these difficult days. And may God bless you as you do so. Guide our hearts in prayer now as we come before God. Let us pray. Living God, you are the creator of all things. You are the creator of all that has been, all that will be, and all that is. We thank you for this glad season and this special day of celebration for another harvest. As we come before you now, we give thanks for those to whom we owe this harvest, all whose labor and dedication enables us to share in the bounty of this world's resources. We pray for our farmers and their families at this time a time of so much change and so many complex issues with COVID and the fallout from Brexit. It seems that there is just one crisis or controversy following another. We ask that you would be near to them, keep them safe on the farms as they work for long hours in order to provide for our, all, all our needs and wants. Lord, be near to them, we ask. We also pray for those involved in the food industry, from those in the factories and on the floors there, to those in the science lab, to those in the supermarkets and restaurants. Lord, we thank you for each one, and we ask your blessing upon them this day, that you would continue to keep them safe from this pandemic. But Lord, as we rejoice today in the physical harvest and give you thanks, we are also reminded of the spiritual harvest and the reality that the workers are in fact few. We pray today for missionaries overseas, we especially remember Chris and Rachel Humphreys. We thank you for their desire to share your word in Portugal to the people of Porto. We ask that you would help them as they seek to rebuild after the pandemic, that you would continue to strengthen the church there and encourage them as they seek to reach out in your name. We ask for all those in Portugal who at this time have been badly affected by coronavirus as we have here. Be near to them. As Chris said, let, let us pray for every physical need and, and spiritual need that they have. Help Chris and Rachel as they learn the, the new language and settle into life over there with their little children. As they work alongside the Cochrane family, may you continue to grow the bonds between those families and may they be an example to those around them of true Christian love. We pray also for our own land and the darkness that has settled into so many hearts. Lord, we lament that falling numbers in church attendance, but we are also asking that you would embolden us, your people, to reach out into the community and not to take on a fatalistic mindset. Renew our enthusiasm to share the gospel with our neighbors and friends, to point them to the safe harbor, to point them to Christ, for he is all that any of us ever need. Lord, we leave these things in your hands knowing that you hear us. For we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we close our time together, can I remind the committee to wait behind to help sort out the distribution of goods and gifts 
Um, can I ask the session to wait behind as well just for a brief moment regarding uh, one of our organizations? And then lastly, in your pew, you'll see a little bit of paper. I'm conscious there's a number of new faces that haven't been out since we introduced this. This is our track and trace. If there's a pen nearby, can I get you to fill that in with everyone that's in your pew and give us a contact number? We keep these for three weeks and then destroy them, but it's just in case there's any contact tracing that we need to do um, after today. We pray and hope that there isn't, but we always need to be safe and secure. As we close, we stand to sing of God's great faithfulness to us, and those wonderful words are of old, great is thy faithfulness. Let us stand to worship God. Just as we close, can I remind you that at the close of the service, uh, you take a seat, the uh, stewards will then direct you out whichever door um, is available. Let us close in prayer. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we could ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.